Good morning, everybody. Welcome you to our morning worship here at Philippi this morning. If you would, if we're glad if you're visiting with us. Uh, we want to certainly welcome you and invite you to come back each and every chance you can. If you would, hit your feet and let's begin by praise my sorrows.
be uh, prepared to go into our communion time this morning. <clears throat> the song we're going to sing is Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. You know, isn't, it, isn't it wonderful to have a, a God that we can give everything to? <laughs> Whenever we're having the best of times in our lives, we can give Him that whenever we're at our worst times in our lives and going through trials and tribulations. Those arms that we're going to sing about here is right there. They reached out for us and he's waiting for you to give it to him. So if you're struggling with something this morning and you're sitting in this room with him, don't give up. Give it to God. Lean on those everlasting arms. May that be your thought this morning. sit around last night a little bit and more or less just went to bed and prayed about it and even got up this morning and started doing a little bit of research on a communion meditation this morning and um, between that and watching Luke on their sermon this morning, their song service and everything, throw some things around, changed some things, made a big mess out of a lot of things, so here we go. 
First, we'll go with some notes I wrote this morning. Snicker bars, cream corn. Oh, sorry, that's a great choice. I got the wrong one first. Okay. I heard an evangelist one time that came and did a cross the road, was doing revival for us. And he did that. I said, that's the neatest thing in the world. Some people can get by with that. Some people are like, really? Okay. Um, I guess the best way to start it out is, is God's the best weatherman, isn't he? Sometimes all these meteorologists, they want to grab these storms. They're going to pull them in. They're going to freak each and every one of us, slam out. Got another one forming now off of Africa. Keep your eyes open. It's coming. Really, people? Put it in God's hands. Sometimes God has to prove a point to us. God has to show us that he's the one that controls these storms. And it's him that we have to go to. I mean, I've got to the point where I quit watching them if I can because I'm just like, really? Which depends on which station you want to watch. I have one worker comes in every morning that gives us a weather forecast every day. So why in the world do I worry about it? i got other people taking care of it. Also, my message this morning, or my communion talk this morning, will jump from place to place to place. Just to let you know, that is me. When I write a paper article, I want you all to please give credit to Susan. She says you write it like you talk. I said, is that not what you're supposed to do? So I put a rough draft down. Susan pulls it together, makes it sound normal. All these large words, they're not from me. I want you to. Sometimes I have... But, um, thank her for being a partner and pulling it together. I pulled Lydia and her up this morning. We're actually going to do a song at the end of my meditation this morning. Wasn't going to do it, and Stephen did it this morning with Luke's sermon, and I said, yep, we're going to do that. If you did not get a chance to get your cup this morning, if you want somebody want to run out and grab it, we can do that to start with. After the storm, things are so clear, things are so pure. It's a good time for us just to stand around and listen to God and take notice. Yesterday morning I got up a little after five as normal, went out the front door. I said, wow, it's pretty calm. This is pretty good. This ain't bad at all. So a little after that, between 5.15, 5.30, I decided to take my walk down to the end of the road and back. About three-quarter of a mile I tried to do every morning. When I was coming back and I got about Luke's house, the Lord said, it's time for you to sprint a little bit. So the rain came. So I said, okay, I'm going to move on. So I got home. I told Sue, I said, I'm going to run to town, check everything out in the office, see how things are going. So I went to town, beautiful, cleared, went out on the boardwalk, walked around the boardwalk, looked at the clouds. I said, this is God's creation, and God's in control. Sometimes we try to do everything ourselves, but sometimes God says, hello, I'm in control. You need to realize that. You need to go to me. You need to ask me what needs to be done. It's not about the storm. What about the storms in our life? Who do we listen to? Do we listen to God or do we listen to others? Do we put our prayers to God or do we go to friends that don't always give us the best advice? For our fear, our anxiety of the storm, rest in the stillness that God is present. Like peace in a storm can renew your strength, your faith. You can lean on your goodness of God. God will carry you through every storm. And God will give you the strength to get through it. In the storms, wind, the waves, he whispers, fear not, for I am with you. God calms the storm as he calms the things in our life. Be still and know that I am God. For the greatest thing God gave us was a command on communion. We take bread, we take juice that represents the body that was given to prove to us that he is still in control. And everything God gave, he gave for us, to give us for our sin. We're going to sing a song this morning. You can either sing with us, you can raise your hand, you can stand, or you can just sit quietly. Just close your eyes, kind of listen to the words. I will forewarn you, we did not practice. I threw this on them at the last minute this morning when they were getting up. But we're going to put it in God's hand this morning, let the message come from him. And then afterwards, we'll just take communion.
Waiting in the back for our K through fifth grade to be dismissed to the back. Thank you, buddy and crew. That's the best meditation you ever done, buddy. Might be because you got the family. Thanks, buddy. Isn't it good to have Lydia back, guys? God in prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege to praise you. Sometimes it comes in uh, through song, and sometimes it comes just uh, because we've read your word and we've been moved. We thank you for the opportunity just to come together and to, to love you and to, to express our love for one another. We pray that in our service today that um, we'd be found faithful and that you look into our hearts and that you would help us to become more what you want us to be and draw us closer to you. Father, as we live in a, a difficult time in our world and sometimes it just sucks the joy out of us and we pray today as we study your word we might learn better how to be a joyful people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I've titled this message uh, Be Joyful. It probably would be better titled Don't Be Depressed. Okay, um, because uh, of the war I'm heading in the message, but uh, I wanted to keep the B stuff going, so I tired of be joyful. 
Um, a 15-year-old boy is shot in Elizabeth City. A transgender male gets another win at a women's 5K. Six states and the Washington, D.C. have no bans on abortion, even up to the time of birth. We're living in some terrible times. Uh, sin is rampant. When Satan overcomes his people, the Bible says they invent ways of doing evil. And current events can be very depressing uh, if we tune in and we stay focused on them. But it's not always just the news that can be depressing. So many things can go wrong in our own personal lives and can really bring us down. Our children may rebel, our loved ones die, um, maybe we lose a job or... Um, our friends disappoint us or betray us. Our, our health goes, go to, goes to pot. So in this world that's tainted by sin, it can be extremely difficult at times to stay positive, to be joyful. But the pa Apostle Paul uh, told us, and even from prison where he was at, he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And what? again, what? I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'll say it again, rejoice. So the Christian personality should be characterized by peace and joy, not by depression, not by turmoil. That's not an easy transformation, but it's a transformation that our Lord Jesus Christ can do for you and me. With his help, we can be that kind of person. I want us to look at a case of depression in the Old Testament. Um, a, maybe a little different way of looking at the prophet Elijah because scripture tells us this he says he came to a broom tree he sat down under it he prayed that he might die I've had enough Lord he said take my life I'm no better than my ancestors now the question would come to me if you just pull that scripture out why is Elijah so despondent here I mean it seemed like totally out of character for this man of God to be that way I mean, there's several reasons that I can think of that he should not have been depressed. Number one, he was a godly prophet. He was one who stood boldly uh, before the wicked king Ahab and warned that God's going to judge the nation and give them a prolonged drought. And then that happened when that famine came. As he predicted, Elijah was forced to flee for his life. But even then, while he was hiding, God sustained him by feeding him miraculously every day. He was also a powerful miracle worker. You know, you think about it, he's a fugitive in a, in a foreign land, and he lives with a widow and her son, and upon Elijah's promise, their food supply never depleted. Their last jar of flour never ran out. The last jug of oil never ran dry. And then, to top it all off, when the widow's son died mysteriously, suddenly, what did Elijah do? Brought him back to life. He raised him from the dead. I mean, this man, he's a serious man of God. A great miracle worker. He was also a courageous leader. After three and a half years of drought, Elijah came out of hiding. And he challenged these 450 prophets of Baal to a, to a showdown to determine which God is the true God. He said, let's build two altars. One to your God, quote God, Baal. And one to Jehovah God, Yahweh. And let's see who's going to be the real God. The one that sends down fire to burn up the sacrifice, he'll be the real God. And, well, the enemies agreed to it. So the prophets of Baal, they, they plead their God the entire day to bring down fire from heaven. They cut themselves, all these things. They finally give up. Elijah prays this simple prayer to Jehovah God. Fire comes down, consumes the sacrifice, and bricks the, even the water that's around them. And they fell to their knees, and they said, Yahweh is God. So... Elijah had so much going on for him, so much in his favor. So why is he depressed? Well, how quickly things can change. With the new wave of public opinion kind of going in Elijah's favor, you know, he ordered the execution of all those false prophets so they could get rid of this uh, malignancy of idol worship, could just get it out of the land. And when Elijah announced to the king, since the people have repented, God will send rain for your crops. That same day, the, a soaking rain comes on this, this dry land. The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord then came upon Elijah, and he ran all the way to Jezreel, about 18 miles. Any of you ready for an 18-mile run? He was so jubilant, he outran the chariot, the Bible says. I mean, he, God gave him some legs, man. He outran the chariot. So that's, that's where we're coming from. But then what happened? Jezebel came along. 
the wicked king Jezebel, Queen Jezebel was not happy at all with this changing of the guard and the execution of all these favorite prophets of hers, these 450 prophets. So she sent this message to Elijah. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. So Elijah was suddenly, uncharacteristically, you know, scared. He fled for his life. He took off. And after an exhausting day's walk in the desert, he saw this broom tree and he prayed there under the broom tree, Lord, take my life. Just one day before, he'd been at the high point of his life. A, a miracle-working, courageous leader, energetic prophet. Had it all going for him. And now, he's longing for death. How could that be? Let's look at some causes of depression as we kind of talk about his life and ours as well. Maybe some of you today can even identify with Elijah. If you haven't, you probably have or you will. More than 17 million people suffer from depression. Les Carter, in his book, Mind Over Emotions, he gives this uh, definition, a clinical definition of depression. He says, a feeling of sadness and dejection accompanied by a gloomy mindset. It can last anywhere from a few hours to several months to even, in some rare cases, years. Depression is distinguished from simple unhappiness by being more prolonged than the circumstances responsible for it warrant. Now, some common symptoms of depression. You've seen them. Insomnia, can't sleep, changing in appetite, loss of pleasure and activities that you normally enjoy. De depressed people have difficulty uh, concentrating. Uh, they develop this pessimistic attitude about life and their thinking patterns. They withdraw from others. That's some of the, the, the characteristics. There's really four degrees of depression because not all depression is alike. Number one is kind of dejection. It's a temporary valley that you kind of go through, a, a rut that you're in. The second is discouragement. This also is a temporary feeling, that, but it, it, it has some hopelessness in it and a loss of enthusiasm about, about life. Then the third, even more severe, is despondency. And this is kind of intense, melancholy type of feelings that it can last for weeks, maybe for months, accompanied by a change in your eating habits and your sleeping patterns, so life begins to not be normal like it used to be. And the fourth, more severe, is despair. This is a danger state. Uh, emotional instability, you, you're pessimistic all the time, you're irrational in your thoughts, you think things that aren't really true and over-exaggerate things and thoughts of, of even death kind of start overwhelming you. Now, Christians that don't get depressed, and I know I'm talking to some of you out there that have probably never been depressed in all your life, you tend to dismiss these melancholy moods as a person kind of being out of sync with God's will. And you may flippantly say, and you may have even said these words, you know, hey, snap out of it. Get a grip. You know, it's not that bad. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, as old saying used to be, you know. But the problem is that Oftentimes, things are too complex for us to just simply give a motivational speech and it to work. Because depression has many causes, and most fall into these four categories. So let's talk about what they are. One is temperamental. I think Elijah was prone to hours of depression because of his temperament. And that's just by looking at him in the Bible. I mean, every one of us is what I used to call wired differently. We're made differently from God. Some are born with this easygoing temperament. You know, you hardly ever get depressed about anything. You're always jubilant and, and smiling about things. And their steadiness has little to do oftentimes with their faith, even their spiritual depth. They just seem to be born that way. It, it's just like duck, the water just runs off their back. Others are more like Simon Peter. You're up and down like a yo-yo, you know. Jubilant one day, in the pits the next, you know. Don't stay the same very long, up and down. Some are like Doubt and Thomas. Kind of have a melancholy type of personality. You're a perfectionist. You're not going to believe it till you see it. And there, you, you know, there's potential problems with that bright side. You say everything's okay, but the glass seems to be always half empty instead of half full. And that's the way you look at life. And those are the folks that can end up depressed for weeks at a time because of the way we look at life. Now the good news is the Spirit of Jesus Christ can 
help us with the dark side of our temperament, no matter where we're at. I think you would agree with me, hopefully, that it's not God's will for you or for others close to you to be miserable most of your life. Think you agree with that? He doesn't intend for us to be that way, you know. And he doesn't want your ugly mood to be spread to other people so they become <laughs> ugly as well. You know, we just share that. Let me share with you what life looks like, you know. And I, No, please don't. I don't want to hear it, you know. As you begin to allow Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your personality, the down times will be less severe. They'll be less frequent. Now, you may always battle against that darkness that's part of your personality or part of that, that your life in that. But you're much more prone not to do that, you know, if you're allowing Jesus to work in you. And just like a person that's obese has to work at it all the time, a person that has a certain personality trait may have to work at it more severely. But if we put into practice the things we're going to talk about today, then God can begin that transformation, and your battle is going to get easier as time goes. So the second one is not just temperamental, but circumstantial. Some circumstances, understandably, lead to us having temporary periods of depression in our life. If I ask for a raise of hands today, of how many people have been depressed at some point in your life. Let's do that. How many people have been depressed at some point in your life? Most everybody here. That depression oftentimes can run because we've lost someone close to us. And some of you say, yeah, that's even where I'm at right now, as I've had a death in the family. And it's a natural part of life in that natural that since sin has come, there's death in our world. And bereavement can take a long time, depending on the person and closeness Sometimes for some, it can be months, even years, to work through. That's why in the Old Testament, when the patriarchs died, God appointed a prolonged period of mourning so the people would have opportunity uh, to grieve over the one they lost, to work through their natural cycle of depression that, that went with that loss of a loved one. And these circumstances, um, I think we see in Elijah's life that provoked his depression. Let's, let's look at some of them. One, he had this great victory. You think, well, what we'll caused the depression from a great victory? Well, he had won this major victory at Mount Carmel there. He literally had a mountaintop experience with God as, as God brought the fire down and licked up the sacrifice and everything. And I think everybody wants to, to be on the mountaintop. We want to have that type of, of closeness with God. But one of the bad things about mountaintop experiences is there's only one direction when you get to the mountaintop to go. And what direction is that? It's down. And the aftermath of a prime victory can be a prime time for depression. Ladies, after you have a baby, sometimes unexplainedly, there's postpartum depression. Baby's fine, you're fine, but you're depressed. Men, we watch a, a football game, like I watch the Sunday night, I watch the Dolphins and Patriots, you know? But I'm actually expecting today, man, they're gonna probably lose to the Broncos, you know? I'm just kind of just waiting for it. I just know it's gonna be a downer. I kind of can feel it already. Or maybe you get the blues in January after Christmas, you know. You get so excited looking forward to Christmas and all of a sudden, ah. Alexander the Great, uh, legend has it that he wept after he conquered the world. He had this to say, there are no more worlds to conquer. There are no more worlds to conquer. We kind of expect the, the celebration, the success to, to continue on. And even as churches, we sometimes run in that and, and it's back down. But it doesn't always continue that way. Sometimes we get disgusted with ourselves. We, it seems like everything is going good. We say, I should be on top of the world, but, I, but I'm down. I, I just don't get it. What's wrong with me? Second thing is, uh, that can bring about a depression is a significant failure. Not only is it a mountaintop, but Elijah had been on the mountaintop. And he had this experience with God. But then he came down to the valley to meet Jezebel. Even with the assistance of the fire from heaven... Elijah could not win over this wicked king, this wicked queen. You think about it. She had to hear what had happened, but she wasn't turned. And when she heard that Elijah had executed all her favorite prophets, she put out a contract on his life. Basically, he was a dead man walking. That's what, where he was. And so that would depress most people. I think most of us would think, okay, I'm not long for this world. She said, by tomorrow, I'll be dead. So the prophet who had won this great victory discovered that she's still out to hit Gideon. I didn't win her over. So God really has put me in a worse mess now than I was before. 
Third thing was loneliness. Elijah ran alone in the desert. There he told God that Jezebel had killed all the prophets and that there was only one left. Now he was exaggerating the problem, which that's what depression will do, won't it? It'll make us exaggerate how bad it is. Nevertheless, he felt alone. Now, if you've ever felt that you've been alone, that nobody cares about you, you're a prime candidate for depression. A college student that goes away for the first time, away from family. Uh, the newly widowed person. The soldier that has left home to ship overseas. The single mom that has to battle, oftentimes, depression more than other people do. The National Center of Health st Statistics report that the age group with the highest suicide rate, this surprised me, is not the publicized teen group. It's actually the 80 to 84 year olds. The highest rate is among those particularly that are divorced and widowed. In fact, Americans age 65 and up are a much higher risk for completing suicide than any other dem demographics. They know how to do it. There's many more try in younger ages. In fact, it's a lot less that actually succeed. Though. Many elderly are lonely. And so the psalmist wrote this, I am like a desert owl, like an owl among the ruins. I lie awake. I have become like a bird alone on a roof. So when you're depressed, you're tempted to, to withdraw from people. You know what I'm talking about. Being around happy people kind of underscores you're not happy. You're miserable. And you're turned off by people that are bubbly. You don't even want to hear it. So you stay at home. You sulk in the corner. You feel more and more unloved and more unwanted. And it's kind of a cycle. You withdraw. And the more you feel unloved, the more you're away from people. And then you want to withdraw even more. Dr. Philip Zimbaro, professor of psychology at Stanford, said this, I know of no more potent killer than isolation. Have you thought about that in your life? Have you kind of separated yourself from other people? You know, during World War II, the Nazis discovered the most effective type of torture was not the kind that we think of, but it was simply putting somebody in solitary confinement, and they would give up their secrets. They couldn't stand to be alone be that by themselves. That's why we read in the Word, encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Now there's a, a third type of category that causes depression, that's psychological. Psychologists say that the number one cause of depression is repressed anger. Now people are angry at others, they're angry at themselves, sometimes they're angry at God. They internalize that, that anger. And many of us have done that. You begin feeling sorry for yourselves. And then you become depressed because of that. Elijah had a reason to be angry. I mean, he had instead reacted to the threat of Jezebel with anger and, or with more faith in God. He reacted in fear. And, and he took off. It says, Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. 1 Kings 19.3. How can a man stand up to 450 prophets of Baal one day, be the man of God, so powerful, and then the next day run from this woman? It just makes you wonder. Well, for one thing, Jezebel wasn't just any woman. She was vicious. She was the queen. She was powerful. She was very intimidating. But another reason, I believe, is Elijah's mental outlook, it wasn't right. This next day. I mean, he had lost sight of God, if you will. And when we start getting depressed, our thinking becomes, it kind of gets distorted. You know what I'm talking about. Zig Ziglar referred to it as stinking thinking. Stinking thinking. Elijah should have remembered the same God that was there yesterday that brought the fire could protect him from this woman. But that negative thinking started dominating his thoughts, and he took off running. He forgot God's power, and he ran for his life. He thought his efforts had been useless. All that he had done yesterday and the mountaintop experience, that's yesterday. God's not with me today. Think of things you've heard people say that kind of reveal their feelings of futility. I've tried to be a loving mate. I make all kinds of sacrifices. She doesn't even notice. So what's the use? I try to be a good parent. But it doesn't seem to make any difference. I rush home to work. I fix a decent meal. I try to be nice. And all they do is gripe about everything. Nothing I do seems to matter. I've tried to get out of debt. 
But we just can't seem to make it. I mean, we discipline ourselves. We, we stick to a budget. We do things, you know, that only within that budget. Then all of a sudden the car breaks down or, or something else. And we spend thousands of dollars here and it's futile. We're right back in the mess we're in. Dr. David Bums in his book, Feeling Good, he gives us hope. He says, most depression arises from erroneous thinking. We have it within our power to control the thoughts that dupe us into this needless gloom. Now, whether your depression is, is caused by futile thinking, maybe it's repressed anger that you have, maybe it's fear, there's good news. We don't have to continue on with that stinking thinking. That can change. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Let's talk about the fourth cause, though, of depression. That's physical. Medical researchers discovered that some people have chemical imbalances, a, a lack of serotonin in our bodies, and that a chemical in our brain that kind of makes us to be more prone to prolonged feeling of despondency when we don't have enough of it. So there's medicines that help. Um, you've heard, and maybe some of you take medicines for bipolar or, or manic depressant. Now, I say that because I believe drugs should not be our first recourse, but I've seen some mind-altering drugs prescribed too quickly to people, and this, it really was a sin problem there, not a physical disorder. But I've also seen, on the other hand, where people that had serious disorders were helped by some medication. So get a second opinion on that. But it's clear, if, if you have this physical problem, be grateful to God that there's something out there that can help. Chemical imbalances also can be self-induced. People that who take illegal drugs and also sometimes drugs that even are prescribed uh, by a doctor or we drink a lot, we can find ourselves in a cycle of depression caused by the chemical, caused by what we took to make get us out of our slump or whatever it is, or trying to drink to, to, to drown our sorrows. It becomes an addiction that's formed. And now we're even worse off than we were. Hey, can you pass me my lemon juice right there? I do I need that up here. <clears throat> they picked corn on three sides of our house. <laughs> right before the storm, thankfully it blew a lot of it out, but I still got some in my system. <clears throat> I think even things like a, a poor diet, a lack of exercise, uh, or physical exhaustion can also affect our, our feelings of depression. You know, it's no secret that the more tired you are, the more likely you are to feel depressed and down. Elijah was exhausted. I mean, we, we just read, he ran 18 miles, and uh, he outran a chariot. He was exhausted, and then he sits down on the broom tree the next day, Praise God to take his life. Being a Christian doesn't exempt us from the consequences of fatigue. No matter how healthy, you know, no matter how energetic or motivated that you might be, we've got limited resources. You know, if you burn the candle both ends, so to speak, eventually someone says you're going to burn out if you do that. So if you're exhausted, you're more vulnerable to being depressed. Now, when Jesus met a man by the pool of Bethsaida, he, the man had been disabled for 38 years. And he asked this question. I've always read this question. At first glance, it just seems like, that's a strange question, Jesus. Why would that be the first thing you say? But he says, do you want to get well? He's been lame for 38 years. Some sick people don't want to get well. They like feel, feeling sorry for themselves. Some people make a career out of being in an ugly mood. They want to manipulate people, to control people. They love others to ask how you do it so they can go in to tell them all these different things are going on. We need to make a decision today that we don't want to be like that because nobody really likes being that person, nor do we like being around that person. Doctors Murnif and Meyer contend strongly that the emotional pain of a clinical depression is totally unnecessary totally avoidable experience. I love the title of her book, Happiness is Choice. Happiness is a choice. Now, without Jesus Christ, I think that's not true. Okay, I think the title is just hogwash. But with Jesus Christ, who said, I can do all things. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That's the truth, isn't it? That's truth. We can change through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, our depression to joy. He can do that in our life. 
So decide now, no matter what your circumstances, that you're willing to let Christ transform you. So let's lastly look at the cures for depression, you know. 2 Corinthians 7, 6 says the Bible promises that God will comfort the downcast. When Elijah despaired, even of life, God appeared to him. He did four things for Elijah that cured his depression. Four things that provide, I think, a perfect prescription for you and me today for overcoming this depression that we might face in our life. I don't want to pretend that a person with a chemical imbalance or a serious psychological problem now can suddenly get well like Elijah did. Okay, we're not talking about that. But most of us can moderate our personalities with God's help if we follow this prescription. Let Jesus transform us. Number one is recuperation. God first took care of Elijah's needs. Look what he did in 1 Kings 19, verse 5. Then he, Elijah, lay down under the bush. He fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head, there was some bread baked over hot coals. There's a jar of water. So he ate, and he drank, and then he lay down again. God was kind to Elijah. He didn't chastise him for his sour attitude. He didn't lecture him about a lack of faith or courage. He just let him rest. And he provided food for him to eat. So I think one of the things we need to know about is we need to know when to stop working. We need to know when to rest. Now, perhaps you're raised with a strong work ethic and you're most fulfilled when you're working, when you're doing something. Well, that's good. The Bible talks about lazy hands make a man poor, diligent hands bring wealth. That, that's good. But some people take this to the extreme. Their work ethic drives them to the point of exhaustion, and they, they never stop. Uh, are you one of those people that maybe have a hard time resting? Do you take work home with you? Do you keep your cell phone on day and night all the time? Do you even try to cram work into vacation time that, to keep you from, quote, getting bored? Uh, you call back to the office all the time trying to find out if everything's okay, fretting over work even when you're not working because you're thinking about it. One of the most spiritual things that you could do today is to rest and recuperate. Learn to relax. You know the Jews were commanded one day out of seven to do what? Rest. To rest. Sabbath, to rest. They also celebrated several holidays. They were commanded. They even had specific laws they had made about how far you could walk and what you... Now, they took it too far, but they were commanded to rest. Every seventh year was supposed to be a, a, a year sabbatical, if you will. God wanted them to learn to rest and refresh himself. Who rested on the seventh day? God himself. He set the example for us. Jesus' ministry lasts three and a half years, yet he spent his first six weeks on a personal retreat in the wilderness. Throughout his ministry, he'd occasionally go up to a mountaintop and pray alone. He'd go to the other side of the lake to, the lake to get away from the crowds. And he knew how to rest. He knew there was balances in life. No wonder God said, be still and know that I am God. So learn how to shift gears. Learn how to relax, refresh. Secondly, eat right and exercise. Now you don't quit preaching, don't meddling now, preacher. And I'm talking to, to Glenn here, too. I'm learning. You know, Elijah was made to eat properly. An unhealthy diet, diet or lack of exercise will make your depression worse. So when we eat right, we exercise regularly, we give ourselves the proper amounts of sleep, we'll have a much easier time keeping the blues away. And, and God knew Elijah needed this. So he sent an angel to minister to his physical needs. The angel commanded him, get up and eat. He told him, he command, get up and eat. And then he let him go back to sleep. He got him up again. And what did he do? He ate again. He refreshed him. He sent him to minister to his physical needs. Now, if God sent an angel to you today to minister to your physical needs, what do you think the angel would tell you? I never thought about that. If God sent an angel to minister to your physical needs today, what would he tell you? Put down those potato chips. What are you doing with that ice cream again? Why don't you turn off that TV and go for a walk? I wonder what he would say to us. It's difficult to overcome depression if we're not eating right, if we're not getting rest and relaxation, if we're not sleeping well. Number two is revelation. God helped Elijah get his mind off himself 
by putting it on the awesome power of God. Look what he says in verse 11. Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. That's what he tells Elijah. And Elijah gets three impressive glimpses of the evidence of the power of God, followed by God's presence himself. Look what happens in verse 12. Then a great and powerful wind was apart. It shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he went out and he stood in the mouth of the cave and a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah got depressed because he, like you and me, oftentimes took his eyes off of God. That simple. And then he had a pity party under a tree. He felt unappreciated. He felt unproductive. He felt uh, unloved. But once he got his eyes off himself and he saw this tornado and this earthquake and this fire and, and then God, he realized God was right there and he's more powerful than all our problems. Amen? He's more powerful than whatever you got going on right now in your life. He is. Then he was ready to listen to that small voice of God, that still voice that told him just to be still before me. I think we erroneously think many times the way out of depression is I've got to analyze our problems. And that's, that's me. I've got to understand what's going on. You know, and I focus on you know, how to get through this. and It's all about my needs and how am I going to get through it. But what we really need to do is kind of just forget all that and then turn our focus to God and say, God, you know, what do you want me to do? Hey, what do you have for me right now? I want to praise you for your wonderful one. Look, look at what Psalm 42, David said. Why, my soul, are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will praise him, my Savior, my God. David had plenty of reasons to be down. Saul was chasing him for his life. He's hiding in caves. Now, how can you allow Jesus to transform your depression to joy if we're unwilling to focus on him? It's not going to happen. We've got to focus on Him. Jesus will heal us if we primarily focus on Him, His Word, and prayer, and, and His church. I know it sounds like a simple answer, but that's, that's the good advice of Scripture. It comes from God, God Himself. When we're depressed, we need to get back to the basics. Read your Bible and pray. When you're depressed, read about how God is there to nourish your soul. To, he's there to help you. David sought that. Look at Psalm 143. Answer me quickly, my Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me. I'll be like those who go down to the pit. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go. For you, to you, I entrust my life. God knows what you're going through. And even when we don't even know how to pray, the New Testament tells us the Spirit helps us in our weakness. To know how we ought to pray. And he, he intercedes with groans. You ever been where you just don't know what to say? And, you know, you, you get to the Lord, and, but the Spirit helps you to pray to Him. Do what you're doing right now. Secondly, go to church. Force yourself to worship with God's people. The Bible commands it. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, His courts with praise. Sing and make music from the heart to the Lord, Ephesians 5.19 says. Now, the opposite is what we don't need to do. According to Hebrews 10, 25, we shouldn't avoid worshiping together, forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. When you're down, the worst thing you can do is to stay home from church. A philosopher once said, if you act the way you wish you felt, you eventually feel the way you're acting. Don't wait till you feel like going to church. Get up, go to... What if you went to work every time you just felt like going to work? I see a lot of unemployed people out here. And it's the same way with worship. We go, and then oftentimes the feeling comes when we, we get there. But we've obeyed and we've gone. And the songs and the prayers and the message and the meditations and the fellowship can help us if we allow God to work in that way. Thirdly, is our responsibility. God came to Elijah in the still, small voice, and he asked him, What are you doing here? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord. In verse 14, the Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've broken down your altars. They've put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Notice how God helped Elijah 
overcome, his, overcome this depression by giving him a new challenge. Look what he says to him, the very next verse. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel, king over Aram. Also, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshah, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, uh, from an Abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. Now, notice God, what God didn't do. God, God did not exempt Elijah from Jezebel's wrath. He just gave Elijah a new responsibility. I want you to go right back there to work. I want you to anoint some new kings, God was saying to Elijah. I want you to go and I want you to open a school of, uh, of training new prophets who can take your place. Get ready to, to hand over the reins to Elisha. I'm going to expand your ministry is what I'm going to do. So when we get depressed... We don't usually have as much of a pity party when we take on a new challenge and we find a new emphasis in our life. So when we're depressed, we need to develop good habits, not bad habits. We don't need to lie on the couch and watch too much TV and overeat and throw pity parties. There are cycles that are, that are hard to break. We need to rejoice in the Lord that he's got something new for us to do. Ask for a, a, something new. It might be simple as, as a new hobby. It might be a new exercise routine. It might be a new devotional that you pick up. It might be taking a, teaching a Sunday school class or coming to Sunday school for the very first time. It might be changing jobs. It might be something of these things. But ask God to, for something new in your life. You usually don't need a, a, an exemption from responsibility. Sometimes we think, well, I'll just start dropping out of these things and I'll feel better. And oftentimes that's just the opposite. We need to take a, something of a new opportunity. Lastly, his relationships. Elijah felt so lonely. I mean, he said to God, I am the only one left. Now, God knew Elijah needed a new relationship. So he told him to appoint a successor, Elisha. And this would prove to be a great friend and supporter for Elijah. I mean, these men not only had similar names, but they were both men of great faith as well. They had a oneness of spirit, if you will. And Elijah became mentoring Elisha. He started right away. And they developed this meaningful and lasting friendship. He also told Elijah that he was wrong. You, you think you're alone? God told him this. I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouth has not kissed him. Elijah wasn't alone. He had 7,000 allies. He just felt alone. And loneliness can be depressing. And the longer we're depressed, the more tempted we are to keep our friends at a distance. And that makes us more lonely. And it just builds on that. So for battling depression, be alert to the relationships God may be providing for you. Make some new friends. Perhaps you can uh, find somebody new that, you know, or somebody that, that hasn't heard your problems. Or, you know, somebody who can encourage you. Look, look at what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4. Two are better than one. Because they have a good return for the work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who fails and who has no one to help him up. Find somebody that's going to, to, to inspire you, to encourage you, and, and let you be yourself. Secondly, focus on serving others. Paul gives some great advice in the Philippians 2 as we come to a close today. To help us get our, our eyes off of ourselves and our problems. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others better than yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So he says, quit thinking of, about yourself and, and your misery and what you're going through. And go out and, and serve somebody in need. Get your focus on someone else and what they're going through. Don't wallow in a, in, in a self-pity uh, party that you're having for yourself. Determined to get your mind off yourself by maybe it's mowing somebody's yard, maybe it's taking flowers, maybe it's visiting a nursing home, uh, maybe it's starting a new ministry, maybe it's, it's doing any of a number of things, but we need to make sure we're doing things to get our focus off ourselves and onto others. Because remember, the greatest command is love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. And so he says, love other people, show that. An interesting scripture as we uh, look at John 15 and 11 today. In the midst of his final words, Jesus' final words to his disciples, before his death, he said these words. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you 
and that your joy may be complete. Though Jesus knew that each of these disciples, and most of all himself, was going to have to endure incredible suffering, here he says, my joy would be in you, and that this joy may be complete. How could he do that? Because Jesus knew that our joy wasn't based on circumstances. It's not to be based on what's happening today or yesterday or going to happen in the future or what's in the news or the storm that's coming in or the storm that's not coming in. It's not to be based on those things. Our joy is to be based on our relationship with Lord Jesus Christ and what He's done for us and what He continually does for us all the time. We know the end of the story, don't we? We look to the back of the book in the book of Revelation and we know that we are the, the conquerors. We're the champions. We know that God wins and the devil loses. And because of that, we know that story. That's not just a story. That story is the truth of what's going to happen. That we're part of the victory team. That we're part of the, the team that's celebrating. We're part of, as Christians, the people that are, will overcome the world. That's what the Bible says. So when I look at that verse again, and if you'd say it with me, I think it's on your screen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. One more time. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Does that mean you'll always be happy? No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that you'll never face difficulty. No, it doesn't mean that either. It doesn't mean you'll never mourn the loss of a person. It doesn't mean that. But it does mean that in the midst of our sorrow or our circumstances or whatever we go through, that our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to give us hope and joy and peace and a way to make it through those things in this life. And these things here are what? They're temporary, right? Only temporary. What we're going to have and what we have with our relationship with Him is eternal. If you're outside of Christ today, He offers an invitation for you to have that eternal relationship that will go past this life to live with Him forever. To believe that He is the Son of God. Repent in, of your sins. Confess Him as Lord. Be baptized in Christian baptism and walk with Him daily. Maybe that's what you need to do today. Um, if the Lord so moved you, I pray that you come. Or maybe some just want to come today and ask for prayer for some depression or some things that are going on, whatever it might be. Why don't you come? Let's stand together and sing our closing about the goodness of God. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness.
celebration that afternoon right after lunch right in here uh, so i hope that you're making plans for that and inviting folks uh, to come for that okay uh remember two senior trips coming up one in october and one in november sign ups right here for that also our, our next kind of big event for the church after homecoming is trunk or treat and we do have signs for that um, out there as well i'll bring your vehicle out and out of the trunk of your car and uh, you can decorate that up and uh, share uh, some goodies with the uh, folks in the neighborhood is our outreach to them. Any other uh, announcements today that you made? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you for the day. Thank you for our privilege of getting together. Thank you, Father, for the joy that we have in our lives because you're our Savior. Help us daily, Lord, to love you and to show forth our belief and our trust in you to show how good you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Sunday school will be here in about uh, 12 minutes.